Hey, how you doing? This is RJ. So, in my last few videos, I've been talking about the history of the quote-unquote progressive movement within comic books and how this progressive ideology has now taken over the comic industry. And, in my estimation, this history centers around one specific event, and that specific event is the hiring of Sana Amanat by Joe Quesada at Marvel Comics, and she was specifically hired in order to change the direction of Marvel Comics and how comics themselves were made. Now, Sana Amanat stated herself that at that time she had only worked at a small indie company for three years. She felt that she had very little experience within comics and the comic industry and she was looking for a job outside of the comic industry. And yet, Joe Quesada specifically sought her out, offered her a job, told her a position was waiting for her and that position would include her changing the entire direction both of Marvel Comics and how comics themselves were made. So a number of questions arise from this event. Number one being who is Sana Amanat and number two being why did Joe Quesada specifically choose this individual, this individual who had very little experience in comics, to change the direction of comics themselves. Now, many people have asked these questions and have come up with blanks. However, what I am going to do today is to present you a picture of Sana Amanat and the how and the why she was specifically selected to change the direction of comics. Now, to begin with, I would think that this project that I'm about to embark on would be much more suited for a reporter, but I'm not a reporter. I'm a storyteller, so what I'm going to do is to present it to you as a storyteller. And for discretion's sake, we will say that even though I am using sources publicly available in order to support the statements that I make, this is simply a story. This is simply a mental exercise to explain the how and why and what this means for the industry itself. So, to begin with, Sana Amanat has always portrayed herself as growing up in New Jersey in a very struggling environment. She has portrayed Kamala Khan, her creation, as an imitation of herself, the daughter of an immigrant family, a Muslim American growing up in New Jersey, and the struggles that she has to endure in order to grow into the woman that she wishes to be. This is the portrayal of both Kamala Khan and Sana Amanat that is usually given. So, to begin with, let's ask the question, is this portrayal of her early life accurate? And I would say no. And in order to both give you the portrayal of her early life and answer the questions that I have stated at the first, we must look at Sana Amanat's family itself. Sana Amanat is the daughter of Dr. Sharif Amanat and his wife Hamadi. Both were born in Pakistan, attended the American University of Beirut for their undergraduate degrees, and then sometime prior to 1964, both emigrated to the United States. After that time, Sharif Amanat went to Columbia University where he obtained his PhD. He then moved his family to an upscale part of New Jersey and began to take in a large extended family from overseas. He and his wife became, as Sana Amanat describes, pillars of the community and were the driving force behind creating many different community organizations, such as the American Islamic Academy in Bunton, the Jami Eid Mashid Islamic Center, the JMIC in Montvale, and I'm going to butcher names in this video, by the way, just to let you know. And they had four children, three boys and one girl, being Sana Amanat, who was the youngest of the four children. Of those three brothers of Sana Amanat, two are now publicly known, the most notable being Omar Amanat. Omar Amanat, according to his own website, is a self-taught computer programmer. He wrote computer programs within the 90s that dealt with stock exchange and sold some of those programs in 1996 for an estimated $230 to $270 million. After that point, he used his money to create various media organizations. And for various reasons, 
He created these media organizations so that he could use them to promote innovations within mass media that would in themselves promote cultural change. And he was constantly looking at the power of media in order to change the world. These companies made Omar Aminat very successful, and he became, and I quote, the most influential person in Hollywood that you have never heard of. However, many of the productions that he was behind you have heard of. He was one of the central producers for movies like The Twilight Saga, like Red, like The Hurt Locker, and many more that you have probably seen. Now, Omar Amanat continued to have varying success with his productions, and at the same time, he liked to live the high life. And within Hollywood itself, he became known to the insiders as, and I quote, a serial swindler. This all led to the prosecution of Omar Aminat on the charges of fraud and conspiracy to commit fraud and many other charges of which he was convicted in December of 2017. Now, during his trial, many important facts came to light. Number one being that Omar Aminat employed many of his relatives, including his brother, his mother, his father, and various other people within his extended family in order to promote the fraud that he was convicted for. He also at one point took his money and created a family trust called the Aminat Family Trust and used this to promote his business dealings. Now, the question arose during the trial of how Omar Aminat was able to convince so many investors to provide him with money of which he then defrauded them of when he was known as a serial swindler. Well, the answer to that is that he employed a connection with one of the members of his family in order to appear reputable. Now, this family member that helped him appear reputable is Huma Abedin. Huma Abedin was one of the people that the Aminat family brought in as part of their extended family. She had very close ties with Omar Aminat and her family, and so did her father. And if the name of Huma Abedin sounds familiar to you, it is because she was the chief personal assistant of Hillary Clinton and also worked under Hillary Clinton for various organizations, one of which was the Clinton Foundation. She also came into the news when, if memory serves, five sitting congressmen signed a letter saying that she should not have access to such information that Hillary Clinton was allowing her to because her father, one of the people brought into this extended family by the Aminats, was suspected of having ties to known terrorists and known terrorist groups such as the Islamic Brotherhood. But back to the connection between Huma Abedin and Omar Aminat. The connection between these two was explored during the trial, and it was shown that through various organizations that Huma Abedin had access to, including the Clinton Foundation, she helped Omar Aminat and, I do believe, the Aminat Family Trust to secure funding from the Clinton Foundation in order to create and or support humanitarian organizations. And it is because of these organizations that Omar Aminat was given legitimacy in the eyes of the people who did not know him. And it was through this legitimacy of these institutions that he had founded and was connected to that he was able to draw in more and more investors, even though he was known as a serial swindler. This, of course, led back to large donations on behalf of Omar Aminat and his organizations to the Clinton Foundation, of which we know at least $1.2 million was given. So this was a reciprocal association of the two, not just those two, but also of the Aminat Family Trust. Now, a quick note here about the Aminat Family Trust. On their website, their specific goal is, and I quote as follows, the Aminat Trust works towards greater tolerance and social justice, gender equality, solutions to environmental challenges, educational opportunities, and material improvement of disadvantaged communities worldwide. I will also have to note that separate charges have been brought against both 
Huma Abedin, and Omar Aminat's brother in connection with Omar Aminat's fraudulent dealings. Now, finally, with all of that in mind, let's look at Sana Aminat. First of all, to answer the question of whether she had a very difficult and trying early life, well, the answer would be no. When you have a sibling who, when you are in high school, has traded his company for over $200 million and has become, again, quote, the most influential man in Hollywood that you've never heard of, this, to me, does not sound like hardship. Now, the question still arises, who is Sana Aminat and how did she get into a position to change the course of the production of comics themselves? Well, very briefly, as I have stated, Sana Aminat is the youngest of four siblings of this family that I have just described. She attended Barnard College, where she obtained a bachelor's degree centered around political science and Middle Eastern studies. And she has noted that as early as her high school and continuing into her university, she was involved in community organization of the kind that her family typically was engaged in. When she finished her university, her intent was to become a reporter. She worked in media briefly and then as a freelancer, and only after that point was introduced into comics through a job at Virgin Comics. Now again, the question becomes, how did Zana Aminat get introduced into Virgin Comics to begin with? Was this simply a job that she stumbled upon? Well, most probably not. The owner of Virgin Comics was a good friend of Omar Aminat, Sana Aminat's brother. And it is most likely that Omar Aminat used his influence over his friend to try to get his little sister a job within media, possibly in order to promote his own vision of using various kinds of innovative media in order to change the world and change the mind of the world on various progressive subject matters. However, Virgin Comics folded within three years, and Sana Aminat once again was without a job. At that point, she has stated herself that, once again, she was seeking to become a reporter. She had no intent to get back into the production of comics at all. Until, of course, in 2011, Joe Quesada, the head of Marvel Comics, appeared on her doorstep and offered her a job, saying that a job was waiting for her and that he wished her to change the direction of Marvel Comics. Now, once again, the question is, why did Joe Quesada specifically choose this very obscure individual to present a job to in which she would change the direction of the comic industry and certainly Marvel Comics itself? Well, it's not a large stretch of the imagination to believe that Joe Quesada already had previous knowledge of the Aminad family. Certainly, as a native New Yorker, he would probably have known of the Aminad family themselves within their community organizations within the area, both within New Jersey and New York, the Aminad Family Trust, which did the same, and also Omar Aminad, who at that time was still flying high as the most powerful man in Hollywood that you have never heard of. Also, two other former members of Virgin Comics, Charlie Beckerman, and Mark Panacea were both taken into the Marvel fold after Virgin Comics had closed down. Again, it's no stretch of the imagination to postulate that these two individuals brought Sana Aminat's existence up to Joe Quesada, Joe Quesada either with his knowledge of the Aminat family or investigating the ties of the Aminat family, saw what an advantage it would be to have Sana Aminat within Marvel Comics. Certainly, the public available information of how much his family, both within the Aminat Family Trust and each of the individual members of the Aminat family, had done to promote progressive movements both within the states of New Jersey and New York and within Hollywood itself. Now, this is of course all speculation, but it is given a level of credibility by the following scene. Uh, my name is Sana Amanat. Uh, I'm an editor and director of content development at Marvel Entertainment, a part of the Walt Disney family. Two years ago, writer G. Willow Wilson, artist Adrian Althona, and I created a story about a young woman with dreams of being normal. Her name is Kamala Khan, and she's a Muslim American girl from Jersey City. We comic folks call her Ms. Marvel. 
Once she began her hero's journey, though, Kamala discovered that she wasn't on the path to being like everyone else. Her journey, her challenge was to seek and create her own identity on her own terms, owning her differences as strengths. Her story has challenged misperceptions about minorities, about women, about anyone who has been marginalized for their differences, and it has connected with fans the world over. Being normal isn't one race, one gender, one point of view. Being normal is being different, and being different is being American. At Marvel, we work to make the aspirational relatable with heroes like Spider-Man, Iron Man, Ms. Marvel. We seek to share stories of heroes that showcase what the world actually looks like, because diversity is not a trend, it is simply life. <laughs> the images we share and the stories we tell impact the perception of ourselves and the perceptions of others. It is our responsibility to tell stories that remind our, ear, our, remind our readers that anyone, regardless of gender, race, religion, or even a Muslim American girl from Jersey City, can be a hero. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of barrier-breaking heroes, I'd like to introduce you to one of mine. Under his leadership, he has made women's issue a part of the national dialogue. He has, <laughs> he has championed equal pay and paid leave, and of course, created the, women's, um, the White House Council on Women's, Women and Girls. Um, and more importantly, he has shown us that in order for true gender equality to flourish, men have to be a part of the conversation. Men must be feminists too. Of course, if you don't have the opportunity to be the leader of the free world, it's not, that doesn't happen often, you can still follow the example he sets as a dedicated father raising two smart, capable young women and being the supportive husband of a real life superhero. Ms. Michelle in the form of, of course, Ms. Michelle, as I like to call her. Uh, without further ado, please welcome the man you know as the President of the United States, but we at Marvel call Spider-Man Sidekick. <laughs> I can already tell this kind of rowdy bunch. <laughs> it is good to see all of you. Welcome to the White House. Uh, thank you, Sana, for your incredible work. Uh, Ms. Marvel may be your comic book creation, but I think for a lot of young boys and girls, uh, Sana's a real life superhero. So, with this little exchange firmly in mind, the question needs to be asked. How did this self-described lowly worker at a comic company gain access to the most powerful man in the world, a sitting U.S. president? Well, of course, the most direct possibility is that Sana Amanat's close cousin, who she had partly grown up with, Huma Abedin, was still sitting within the top positions within the staff of Hillary Clinton itself and within the organizations of Hillary Clinton, such as the Clinton Foundation, which itself had close ties with the Amanat Family Trust. Therefore, it is most probable that through these ties, Sana Amanat gained access to a sitting president of the United States. But that begs the further question. Was this interaction generated by what was going on at the time, or was it generated by the fact that Sana Amanat was specifically placed within this position in order to serve a greater purpose? Now, at first glance, that statement sounds like a conspiracy theory. But again, let's look at the facts. The Amanat family was specifically known in New Jersey since the 1970s to promote a progressive agenda. This progressive agenda was taken up by Omar Amanat, who wished to use media in innovative ways in order to promote, 
again, this progressive agenda. This progressive agenda that he wished to promote, and that he promoted not only through his own organizations, but through the Amanat Family Trust, of which many members of the Amanat family were connected, was facilitated by the extended family member Huma Abedin, who, through her high-level connections with the Clinton Foundation, had a reciprocal association with Omar Amanat, with his various companies and organizations, and with the Amanat Family Trust, wherein the Clinton Foundation supported them by giving them high levels of respectability of which Omar Amanat and his various family members would use to generate money which would circle itself back as donations to the Clinton Foundation. When all of this has been taken into consideration, what I have stated sounds less like a conspiracy theory, but at the very least, an open possibility. A possibility that Sana Amanat was specifically brought in to this organization of Marvel Comics in order to institute the same policies that her brother had hoped to institute within Hollywood. And that intent, once again, was to innovatively use various kinds of media in order to change the direction of people's minds towards a progressive mindset. At the very least, if taken as true, this would explain many of the actions and statements made by Sana Amanat. Statements such as the one she had made at the 2018 Comic-Cons, where she stated that when a book doesn't do well financially, you can't just look at the numbers. You have to look at the influence which this book is making, and that is what they consider a success. And to bring this all to a close, I would have to say that if this were true, Personally, I don't see it as having a grand overarching scheme behind it. But something very simple, although something very imperative to the underlying success of the progressive movement, and that is the further degradation of and the destruction in the minds of Western youth of the traditional idea of a self-sacrificing hero. So, if I've given you anything new to think about, hit like, hit the shield in the lower right-hand corner of your screen to subscribe, and leave me a comment. Tell me what you think about all this. All right. I'll see you later. Bye.